Today, it's my pleasure to introduce one of the uh, project managers from the study that I've just alluded to. Sarah Moreland Russell is from the uh, Center for Tobacco Policy Research in the uh, George Warren Brown School of uh, Social Science uh, here at Washington University. So, Sarah. pleasure for me to present the findings of this study. The purpose of this study was to measure nicotine in bars and restaurants throughout the St. Louis metro area. To do this, we placed monitors that measure air nicotine in 20 venues, 10 were bars and 10 were restaurants. 16 venues allowed smoking indoors and 4 were smoke free. We left the monitors in the venues for 7 full days. We also assessed employees' exposure to secondhand smoke by collecting hair samples from 78 employees who worked in the participating venues. In addition, each employee completed a questionnaire that assessed health issues related to secondhand smoke exposure and attitudes regarding smoke-free workplaces. Since airborne nicotine can only be come from cigarette smoke, it is a reliable, scientifically accepted marker for assessing secondhand smoke exposure. While airborne nicotine concentrations do not directly translate into individual health risk, it does prove the presence of secondhand smoke, an established cause of cancer and cardiovascular disease. In the interest of time, I will highlight the most important findings from this study. First, nicotine levels in venues that allowed smoking were significantly higher compared to those in smoke-free venues. In fact, nicotine levels were 31 times higher in smoking venues. However, smoke-free venues still had some detectable levels of nicotine. The small amount of secondhand smoke in these smoke-free venues is likely due to after-hour smoking by employees or secondhand smoke coming in from the outside, either through windows or doors. Therefore, even though going voluntarily smoke-free decreases the levels of secondhand smoke exposure, it doesn't completely solve the problem. Furthermore, bars and restaurants with ventilation systems had higher air nicotine concentrations compared to those without a ventilation system. Since we didn't find any significant difference in the number of patrons smoking between venues with or without ventilation systems, this finding most likely, most likely reflects that ventila ventilation systems were actually recycling the air back into the same space. These findings confirm the numerous studies that prove ventilation systems are not effective in eliminating secondhand smoke exposure. Findings from the hair samples yielded similar results. Nicotine was found in all employees' hair samples regardless of smoking status. This demonstrates that all employees, despite smoking status, were exposed to secondhand smoke. As with airborne nicotine, hair nicotine in non-smokers can only be explained by exposure to secondhand smoke. Coupled with the airborne nicotine data that I just presented, non-smokers' hair nicotine levels reflect personal exposure and increased risk of death and disease from secondhand smoke in bars and restaurants where smoking is allowed. Employees also reported smoking-related symptoms including cough, shortness of breath, and excess phlegm. Sensory symptoms noted include red or irritated eyes, scratchy throat, and runny nose. Non-smokers reported these symptoms just as smokers did, again reflecting exposure to secondhand smoke at the workplace. When asked about smoke-free workplaces, 62% of the employees stated they preferred to work in a smoke-free environment. Also, over half of the employees who currently smoke said that a smoke-free legislation would help them quit, and most former smokers said that this legislation would help them remain non-smokers. In conclusion, these findings are not terribly surprising. It is well established that the only solution to secondhand smoke exposure is to implement a comprehensive smoke-free law that includes bars and restaurants. However, 
this study yields the first local data that supports the implementation and enforcement of a comprehensive smoke-free workplace law in the St. Louis area. Employees in St. Louis bars and restaurants where smoking is allowed are exposed to high levels of secondhand smoke while working. As there is no safe level of secondhand smoke exposure, the St. Louis area should not delay in the implementation and enforcement of comprehensive smoke-free laws. Thank you.